Hey everyone, my name's Hayden and I run a natural building company called Curvitecture and we're based in Victoria, Australia. But we ultimately travel all over Victoria, all over Australia and all over the world building and teaching natural building techniques to heaps of awesome people. The presentation today is one that I've done probably for the last 10 workshops that we've run and it's a really good introduction to show people a wide range of natural building techniques how to use them, where to use them, and how to actually physically make them as well. It is just an introduction, so we're not gonna to go too deep into it, but hopefully it'll give you a really good overview so that you can start selecting things for your own homes and your own spaces. A bit about me and a bit about us. My natural building company, Curvitecture, probably officially started about six years ago. I, like so many other people, had the dream of wanting to buy a country property. I wanted to build a solar powered recording studio on it and have this artistic hub where artists can come, they can stay away from the city, away from all the noise and create art ultimately. That probably started when I was about 15, so a few years went on and then I YouTubed how to build a home and something called Super Adobe was one of the first vid videos that came up and I was completely transfixed by it. I was absolutely amazed and incredibly intrigued. So I started following it a bit more online. I found a workshop in Australia that ran it and then another workshop in Australia that ran how to build with it and to learn more about it. And then I was pretty obsessed by that point. So I got to go over to California and study at the Californian Institute of Earth Art and Architecture or Cal Earth for short. And I didn't want to be a teacher when I went over there. I still just wanted to learn how to build my own space on my own property and run away from society. And then by the time I left, I was completely obsessed with teaching it, sharing it with the world. So that's exactly what we're doing here for the first time online. So we're really excited about it. I love the YouTube community and the online community. And I really want to give back to it because I've probably watched about a million hours of YouTube how-tos. So it's really great to be giving something back. I got my notes here with me today, so I'm just gonna be referencing them and also having the original slideshow playing at the same time. I'll put that in the description so you can download it and uh, reference it or look along as we go. But I'll also be chucking it up on the screen along with some photos. On photos, I made this presentation probably about three years ago and I've included some photos that I found on the internet. I'll reference as many as I can, but I did also do it quite a few years ago and I can't find the original source material. So this is an informational educational video. I hope uh, the owners of the photos are okay with it, but if you're not, just get in touch and I'll take it down straight away. Over Curvitecture's life and my natural building journey, we've done a lot of projects. Uh, as I said, it's about six years now of workshops and uh, within that we've built five rocket mass heaters, two seating rings, six domes, two circular huts, uh, garden beds and garden features, landscaping features. We've re retrofitted a shed into an apartment for a family to live in, insulated a modern family home, and uh, lastly culminating in Australia's first legally permitted super adobe and rammed earth home in Victoria, but also in all of Australia. Uh, it's the first one that got all the way through council in this specific technology, which is Super Adobe and Earth Bag Building. It's what we at Curvitecture specialize in. It's what I love, but the beauty of natural building techniques is it's actually best to learn them all and then incorporate as many as you can into your homes and spaces because they're really versatile and they all fill a certain need, which hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have a bit better of an understanding of. So you can follow all of our stuff at www.curvitecture.com. We're also on Facebook, a little bit on Instagram, and uh, yeah, come in, say hi. We'd love to hear from you. You can also leave comments in the comments comment section, and we'll either make some more videos or we'll answer it in the in the section. So don't hold back. Natural building is all about sharing knowledge, and that's what we're trying to do today. So first of all, what is natural building? It's a huge topic and it's something that 
is a little bit different for everybody. Everybody has their own definition of it and uh, I'd like to give a pretty broad one but also a definition that rings true for me and the way that I define natural building. So natural building is building homes and spaces from local, raw, hopefully abundant and sustainable natural materials to be processed as much as possible by humans' hands and humans' power. I extend this out uh, into any spaces or homes which promote smaller, simpler and softer living as the runoff effects from living lives like this, it hopefully promotes and helps to reduce uh, overconsumption, a less communal and more detached lifestyle. So there's the physical actual building a home or a space and the technologies used and the materials used and then there's a lifestyle that goes along kind of hand in hand with those uh, techniques and those spaces uh, which has a larger social impact uh, and, a, and a larger personal impact on uh, the people living within them. A huge thing that draw, drew me to natural building uh, is the community that's around it and the reason there's such a strong community is because natural buildings uh, historically and today are very commonly built with a group of people friends, family, or people that maybe you've never met that just want to come and learn the natural building technique, uh, which is an amazing way to build uh, communities again, which is something in the modern world, definitely in Australia, uh, we're quite divided from our neighbors, from our friends, and we don't, our main focus is work a lot of the time. So we actually lose a lot of connections uh, in our personal lives. And it's bringing back bringing the family back together, bringing the village back together, and uh, you get to do something full of beautiful intention and beautiful energy, which is uh, really quite rare um, in this world. And so they're really powerful, strong weeks or months of building uh, that really help to change and shape people's lives after they're done, especially the people living in the homes. But all the people that come leave with this uh, really um, reinflated uh, spirit and heart and feel that they can make a difference to their world and they can live in a more healthy and happy way by building and living together again. Everyone has their own definition of natural building. There's some um, purists out there who definitely believe that there should be no man-made chemicals whatsoever. Uh, everything should be on from on site or walkable distance to, or maybe you can drag with a horse and uh, everything should be processed by people power, no machines. So that's pretty extreme, uh, but it's also really a admirable and something that is, uh, is really interesting to look into to see whether you can build a home completely naturally, uh, which is something that I think probably most people in Australia and in uh, the modern world would probably say it's almost impossible to do, but it's definitely not. So that's that end of the spectrum and then it moves all the way through to uh, modern building techniques, uh, brick and mortar and timber framed houses with a lot of cement based products uh, chucked in there as well and steel. So. That spectrum, there's a lot to be able to move between and uh, a lot to be able to improve on. Modern building is a certain approach and uh, it's done that way because it's very clearly laid out and it's very, very easy to do the engineering on a building that's been built thousands and thousands of times within a country. So pine timber framing or brickwork has been done for hundreds of years. So the engineering on it is uh, very established, very clear. As long as a few golden rules are followed, then uh, councils and governments know that these houses shouldn't fall down. That's ultimately why I believe things become so entrenched and these ideas become so difficult to move out of and move away from and incorporate something that is less common. So I'm not here to destroy the current 
building technologies or anything like that. I understand why they're there, uh, but I also know that come 200 years ago, everything for the rest of history was natural building. So 200 years versus all of human history, that's a much better, much bigger bank of knowledge that we can draw from and we can pull back into the current times and incorporate them into our buildings and our lives. So legality is a big issue. You need to be able to prove uh, that your building's going to stand up and that it's also going to resist the outside environment, uh, resist or work with uh, to give you a quality internal living environment. That's the most important thing to a lot of councils. The computer programs that are used to uh, put an architectural drawing or design into uh, into this program to assume and calculate, hopefully accurately, what the outside environment is going to do to the inside environment of the home. Uh, those programs are really dense, very well written for where they are, but they do not represent natural buildings well or um, effectively in almost any way. So that's one aspect as to why it's sometimes hard or not done so much to have natural building techniques within your home because it's so hard to prove to council uh, that this home is actually going to be livable in and it's going to stay warm in winter and cool in the summer. So there's a lot that we can improve on there, a lot that we can move forward and we want to work with councils and we want to push the natural building um, technologies and materials as much as we can uh, over the next 10 years but ultimately until natural building is as common with current um, timber or brick veneer homes. So this presentation is going to be outlining 14 major natural building techniques and we're going to be comparing them based on two major at attributes. The first is whether that material or technique is insulation or whether it's thermal mass. I'll explain what those two things are, but those are vital when choosing your uh, technique or your materials to be used. Absolutely vital to the success of your design. The su success being whether the inside temperature of your house is going to be cooling in summer or heating in winter or keeping heat in in winter. The second will be whether that technique is load bearing, uh, which is a term that I'll more clearly define, but it is vital to the success of your home or your structure to understand what load bearing means, where to use load bearing techniques and where you can use infill techniques, which is the second term that I'll explain a bit more. Ultimately, this whole presentation is to educate you on how and where to include different techniques and technologies within your homes and spaces. First off, it all starts with your dreams, your thoughts and the imaginations that you have in your head. First step is always dream big. You have gotta think outside the box and let nothing limit you. Natural building techniques are absolutely wonderful because they make you or encourage you to think in not straight lines. Yes, not everybody wants to live in a weird hobbit dome under the earth, I'm not saying that at all. You can build any shape you want with natural building techniques, some of them. Most of them are versatile enough to build any shape, any size, uh, with the right engineering and the right design. So it immediately makes you think, quite literally, outside the box. So you can think of any shape that you've seen in nature, any shape you love drawing on the side of your shopping lists, absolutely anything that you want, you can build a house that shape out of natural building techniques. Next thing is to list all your needs, major features and spaces specific to you and your life or how you'd like your life to be. So the best thing about building a house for yourself or a space to live in 
is the fact that it's completely customizable. It's something that larger modern building companies, yes, you can customize if you have an architect and you have the time and the money to be able to do that. But if you're buying um, a more laid out design uh, that's already been designed before you've come along or you're choosing from maybe 10 different designs, they're gonna be um, stuck to be able to make as many people happy as possible. So they're not gonna be customized to your life. Um, they'll be altered in some ways to get closer to what your life is, but it'll never be absolutely perfect. So the coolest thing is you can just sit down with a pen and paper to list all your needs and list the most priority, most prioritized spaces in your life and make those ones the biggest and connect them in all the same, in all the right way that'll give your house a intelligent flow when you're moving between the rooms. Um, and also you get to design it to work absolutely best with the outside environment. And that's key that we'll go into more. So you've, you've dreamt, you've done your list. Now the next thing is to observe the land. Observation is a huge permaculture principle and you definitely need to do it with your house and the property that you're on, whether you're on a small quarter acre block in the city or whether you're in a huge 500 acre forest in the middle of absolutely nowhere. It's key, observation is key. Best case scenario, not everyone's gonna be able to do this, but best case scenario would be to live on your property for a whole year to camp from winter solstice all the way through to summer, all the way back to winter solstice. So you'd see every single season come and go, how they interact with each other and how they interact with the land. A huge thing that I'm gonna be talking about is the sun. It's this huge massive powerhouse in the sky that is free. You must incorporate this into your building. You must, otherwise you will be from the get-go shooting yourself in the foot with the amount of, uh, the amount of energy you have to bring into the home to heat it or cool it in the way of being stuck to the grid, using solar, solar power or bringing in coal or wood or wood pellets to be able to heat it. So you've got to watch the sun. Best thing to be able to do is to stand in one spot that you've marked that you'll always come back to that you can see most of your property from and then you find a landmark on your property, a tree or a rock, or whether you're suburban, a telephone pole, and you see where the sun rises from and where it sets in both the winter solstice and the summer solstice. And that'll give you the best indication of how far the sun pulls back uh, when it begins to rise and how far it pushes in uh, during winter. It's really, really good to start incorporating that. Before I started building houses, I had absolutely no real idea about the sun. I knew that in summer it went more above our heads and in winter it went, went slightly less, but I had no actual bearing on how much it does change and how much that affects the home and space that you live in. It's ultimately everything, really. We're in the Southern Hemisphere, so things are very different for us in the Southern Hemisphere versus the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but pretty much everything that I'm saying about the Southern Hemisphere, you just have to reverse it. Uh, so we have north facing windows to capture all the light here in the Southern Hemisphere. And in the Northern Hemisphere, you need south facing windows. So very easy to do that flip. Water over the land is incredibly important. Where water falls, where water pools, and where water flows and moves. They're really, really important to uh, focus on those things and really, really well understand them. If you put your house right in a channel where water wants to flow during heavy rains, which sure, you might only get a really heavy rain event maybe two, three, four times in a year, but those times that that does happen, you can't have your home sitting in the flow channel of that. So that's why it's really good to watch over a whole year and try and catch as many extreme weather conditions as possible. Animals is next and it's really important. If you're on a larger property, uh, like 10, 20, 30 acres, animals are gonna be really present, hopefully. And everything with natural building is trying to reach back out to the natural world and reintegrate ourselves with the natural world. So 
to be able to understand your beautiful animal neighbors and what they're doing and what they're doing during different seasons is really, really important. Where they like to eat, where they like to sleep, uh, where they um, hunt as a pack, if that's what they do, where they nest, uh, anything like that. It's just really important to have that awareness because ultimately we want to be incorporating ourselves as simply and easily as possible uh, into the natural world and to disrupt animals is just a bit lame really they're the first caretakers of this world and uh, we should really respect that and respect them prevailing winds is really really important to understand and know where they're coming from so where does your wind most commonly come from it could be shared directions 50 50 coming from the north and in the south uh, and what type of weather that brings in uh, whether it's cold winds hot winds humid winds or dry winds that will really start to um, uh, affect your house and the internal atmosphere a lot for instance if you live in a cold climate, you don't want massive double doors that are constantly being opened to cool prevailing winds that will come into your home. Little things like this, really, really important to think about that I'll touch on a bit more later. So a huge part Probably the most important thing, aside from the techniques you actually choose, the most important thing you can do, in my opinion, is solar passive design. That is something that gets thrown around a lot. It's used in modern buildings uh, and modern architecture, and it definitely should be used as well as possible in uh, modern natural building homes as well. So let's break that apart a bit. Solar passive design. What does that actually mean? Solar to do with the sun. Passive means there's no other energy put into it. It's a uh, self-supporting system and it's passive. It's not an active system. Active would denote that you as a person or um, some sort of machine needs to put energy and focus into the system to make it work. Whereas this is passive. It needs nothing else except itself to support itself. And design. How you actually think, draw and build your structure. So solar passive design. Super vital. Super important. And it is based on two main parameters. First of all, what direction your building is pointing most importantly, what direction the windows are pointing. And secondarily, it's using where the sun rises in the winter, spends the whole day and then sets, and where it rises in the summer, spends the whole day and then sets. So it's the exact positioning of the sun in the sky at any time during the year. And it's designing, positioning a building and its windows, but also its reflective walls in a way that best harnesses those things. Best harnesses or reflects the sun. So how do we control the winter sun and the summer sun? Or how do we control the sun at any point in the year? There's two things that we can do. We can resist it or we can capture and store that energy. They're the two things, two aspects that you want to be doing during, at any time during the year. So the entire system is calculated off low winter sun versus high summer sun. Those two factors and the slow gradation that changes throughout the year, those two factors are how you design, position your home, how you design and position your roof, and how you design and position your windows to do two main things. Those two main things are you either resist that sun or you capture and store that sun. They're the two things. So capture and store. The first thing we need to understand is what's insulation and what's thermal mass. So insulation is 
anything that includes some or a lot of air within the material. This can be done in a few ways. Any plant-based cellulose-based uh, life forms, so any plants, trees, things like that, they'll have these channels within them where water flows when the plant's alive, but when it's um, cut down and dried, those channels uh, then become long straws ultimately which are hollow so they get filled with air and that gets to bring that air element into the natural building technology so that's the first thing to understand insulation equals air second thing to understand is thermal mass thermal mass equals the opposite of air so density so Lots and lots of uh, particles pushed together really, really closely. Most common form of a natural dense material is stone. Um, probably, aside from iron ore that we then make into steel, uh, it's the most common dense natural material. So capture and store, how do we do that? And what are the things that might change the way that you think about doing that? Here in Victoria, we have quite cold winters and quite hot summers. So we get a good spectrum, uh, but this will be really completely tailored to where you are in the world and what you wanna be doing. So if you're hot and humid, all year round, you're not actually going to be wanting to capture any of the summer's heat. You're going to be wanting to keep the summer's and the winter's heat out of your home and for it to be cool year round. So that's some of the things to be thinking about. Equally, if you live in a very cold environment, year round, summer and winter, you want to be bringing in the sun's rays to capture that energy and store that energy. So I'll let you decide what you need to be choosing. So a huge part of all of this is understanding what insulation and what thermal mass are. Ultimately, insulation is anything that incorporates and includes air within it, either a small amount to a large amount. The more you can get in there, the more insulative it's going to be. Now, the reason for that is really simply and really quickly is this. Imagine we have the sun here. and it's shooting down beautiful rays of energy down onto our material. We're gonna look at the material on a molecular level or maybe in an atomic level, and we're gonna look at it as particles. So uh, the other side to insulation, the opposite to it, is thermal mass. Thermal mass, uh, as the name suggests, thermal to do with heat and mass to do with the density of it, so um, the way that thermal mass works is it can suck in and absorb heat from the sun or temperature, ambient room temperature as well. It doesn't need to be direct sunlight, but it can pull in and charge up like a battery. Very, very common technique uh, used in natural buildings because it's incredibly self-regulating. It's based off the sun, uh, so it's free energy. And uh, if you can incorporate it well into your building, you'll have a very stable internal temperature. So the way insulation, but also thermal mass works in relation to direct sunlight is direct sunlight comes down. <clears throat> and then imagine here we've got one particle of material, of a dense material. And then we've got another particle, another particle Another one, another one. So the way thermal mass and insulation work, they are complete opposites. And they're quite often uh, confused or um, maybe spoken in a similar way with each other, but they, you need to understand that they're completely opposites and you need to harness um, the features of them really well within your natural building uh, to be able to have a building that's going to be a nice stable temp temperature all year round. 
So imagine the sun's rays is coming down and these are particles of whatever material we're using. We don't need to specifically say what it is. These are little particles that are all pushed up against each other. So imagine this is a wall. This is one side of our wall and this is the other side of our wall. So as the sun's rays comes down, it hits one side of the wall or it could be a floor as well. One side of the wall and let's say 100% of the sun's energy is coming through on this side. So we've got 100% coming through here, the sun's rays hitting it. And then let's say for this example, all of these particles are touching each other and they're very close because it's very dense. Density uh, in a material is whether um, the actual physical particles, so not the gaseous uh, particles like air and oxygen that's in our atmosphere, the actual physical uh, material particles are touching each other or relatively close to each other. So there's not much uh, gas or air within it, within it um, and they've been crushed by the earth like rock has, crushed by the earth or something similar to push them really close together. So let's say there's no gaps between these. So 100% energy comes through here. And then as it passes, let's say that it just has a 1% energy loss between each particle. This is very simplified. So if it's coming in this side, we've got 100% coming through this, this side. As it warms up here, it'll warm up this first one and then it, it needs to jump over to here. So it'll jump over to the next one. Let's say each jump, it needs to lose 1%. So that's 1% there. So that's 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5% over to the other side of the wall. So through getting through the entire wall, it's only lost 5% of its original potency and its original power. So here you have the inside of your building, and you're living inside it, and here we have the outside of the building. So the sun's rays that hits this side of the wall, it directly only loses, let's say, 5% of its energy. So it's pumping out and actually radiating heat, radiating 95% of the heat that came in this side of the house. It's very simplified, but that's ultimately how it works with direct sunlight. So that's with a dense material, say brick, um, stone, uh, things like this. Let's imagine now that we're going to be aiming for an insulative material or an insulative technology, so a combination of materials within natural building within the natural building spectrum. So we've still got the, the same one, two, three, four, five solid particles that are in there because we can't build a building out of air. So you need to have some solid particles in there. Maybe they're a cellulose based plant um, particle like straw or leaves or um, timber, anything like that. Um, or they could be a, um, a more masonry based or a silica based particle like clay or like stone. Um, it doesn't matter what those solid particles are, but there needs to be something in there to actually make the structure. And then, we'll do it in orange, we're going to be putting air in there. So something like straw has those cellulose straws within its structure. And once it's dried and the oxygen's all left, the gas is all left, then you're left with these tiny little air pockets ultimately in the, in the whole straw itself, not just down the center shaft of the straw. So we're now gonna put in tiny little dots Let's say we've got one, two, three there, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. We've got three air particles between each, um, between each large material particle. It takes energy for thermal energy to move between particles. So if you've got more particles uh, that are different within there, say a solid and a gas, that's where a lot of energy is lost. So let's say for argument's sake um, that you're gonna lose 5% energy between each air particle. So imagine now we've got 100% of the same sun coming and hitting our wall, but this time we've got three 
gas particles in between each solid particle. So we've introduced a uh, material that has more air in it in let's say that ratio one solid particle to three gas particles. So we're coming in, warming up this side of the wall and then each, let's say the energy lost because when you go from a solid particle to a gas particle, it uses more energy and well, it loses more energy trying to make that transfer. So let's say you lose 5% of the energy per gaseous particle that it needs to skip through. So we've come in here and we've gone 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80. So now for argument's sake, we've lost 80% of our original energy and pumping out the other side is only 20%. That's horribly simplified and probably scientifically a little bit shaky, but that's ultimately what's happening and the things you need to think about between thermal mass and insulation. Thermal mass is dense and it sucks in and holds heat and then slowly releases it over time. And insulation blocks heat by making the heat that does come in, the exact same amount of heat that does come in, make it work way harder to get through that material before it can enter your space. So now that those are hopefully clearly defined, insulation and thermal mass, what do you do if you wanna capture and store that beautiful sunlight? The way that we do it here in the Southern Hemisphere is through large north-facing openings. So capture and store is something that you're only going to want to do in the cooler months because the sun's warm, you want its warmth in your, in your house, so you want to bring it into your house and then store it within your house. During the summer, obviously, you don't want to be capturing and storing any energy at all from the sun. You want to be pushing as much of it away as possible. So the way that we do it is north and east facing windows in the southern hemisphere to introduce that light into the space and then hold it in some way. The way that we do that is through thermal mass floors and thermal mass walls. It can be direct sunlight that'll come directly through the windows and fall directly on say a stone floor, a brick floor, an adobe floor, um, anything like that. And that will hold that energy and then during the, when the night time comes, it'll release that energy. So there's a graph or a chart that uh, goes from sunrise to sunset and then all the way through the night until sunrise again. And that directly relates to how thermal mass works and how it's going to work within your building. So 6 a.m., the sun rises. The house is cool. It's no longer hot from the day before, hopefully, if you've designed it well. So you've got a cool home. The sun rises and you get beautiful sunlight coming in your windows that falls onto, say, a stone floor. You've got a beautiful slate stone natural floor. That floor begins to heat up in the direct sunlight between 6 a.m. and midday. It begins to heat up and then from midday till 6 p.m. is when it's getting its most charge and it's the most warm. Sun sets at 6 p.m. and the floor is completely charged up just like a battery. It's completely charged up and it slowly begins to release its energy back into the home. So the sun is set and your floor is now heating your space. So from 6 p.m. until midnight, it's releasing the most of its energy, and then midnight till 6 a.m., it's releasing slowly uh, the tail end of its energy. So hopefully by the time the sun rises again, it will be pretty close to cool again, and it'll start its process again. Obviously, you only wanna be doing this in winter if you have a cool winter. You don't want to be doing this at all in summer. So you need to then build your eaves of your home and the eaves of your roof in a way that will introduce to bring in and capture the store, the winter sun when it's low in the sky 
And then when it's high in the sky, you want it to be blocked out by the eaves so nothing comes into your house. That whole concept is incredibly dependent on where you are in the world and every single line of latitude and longitude that you move on the earth will change what you actually have to do, what direction you have to point in and all of that. So it's a much more technical issue that we can't go into now, but it's really good to be aware of it. Cooling tubes are really, really wonderful. They're an aspect that I first saw in Earthship buildings, which we'll go into later, and it's a tube that ultimately goes under the ground and it sucks hot air in one end, runs it under the ground, that hot air then cools and then it brings that cool air into your space wherever you want. Some people put them in their pantry or in their food store um, so that you can cool, have a cool space to keep all your uh, food or they bring it straight into their living room or their living spaces and they cool the actual entire house that way. But we'll go into those in a little bit more detail later. Wind scoops are also a really great way to capture and either capture and not so much store, but capture and utilize energy that's already out there. Um, so you've got your prevailing winds coming in. If you traditionally live in a hot environment and your house will normally be warmer more than it will be cool, you point a wind scoop towards the cool prevailing winds. It pulls them in, sucks them down, and then shoots them into your building to help you dump warm air out by opening, say, a window or a door on the opposite side of the wind scoop entry, and it'll push all that warm air through. Um, that's something that's done a lot in much more arid desert uh, climates and uh, it's something I learned a lot about at Cal Earth and uh, it's, they're really, really interesting, but not applicable to all climates at all. Lime is a material that's really commonly used and utilised in natural building. Um, it's less, it's used in a similar fashion, but not definitely not the same, a similar fashion to what um, concrete or cement is used as, but um, concrete and cement doesn't breathe and doesn't um, transmit moisture, so humidity in the air um, or direct rain, um, doesn't transmit moisture as well as lime does. Um, lime also is only heated during its production process, is only heated between about six to 800 degrees Celsius, whereas concrete, cement, sorry, needs to be um, heated to around 1200 degrees Celsius, somewhere around there. So there's a much more embodied energy, which um, CO2 emissions, a huge part of CO2 emissions created by humans is from the construction industry, specifically the cement industry. So lime is a much friendlier version um, of something that's going to take clay, sand, um, and set it up as a more permanent uh, feature. Clay, if it's unfired, so unless you put it in a kiln, which you're probably not gonna put your entire house in a kiln, um, if it's left unfired, it will always want to, and be quite thirsty, it'll always wanna draw moisture into it, whether that's drawing it from um, the ground, drawing it from rain coming and hitting its surface um, directly, or whether it's even just absorbing it from the atmosphere, the humidity evapor evap evaporated uh, water in the, in the atmosphere. Um, clay will always want to suck that in. So if you've, if you've got it paired with something like lime, which sets up uh, more permanently and um, is an antifungal, so if your clay is absorbing a little bit of moisture from the air, um, sometimes mold can grow on it. And if you've got lime working with it as well, lime is actually an antifungal, so that's a really, really good pairing. And lime can breathe and move a lot more than cement can. So um, that's why lime is the um, chosen, um, the chosen material uh, to pair up with natural buildings. A clay slip or hydrated clay it's the gold of natural building and really is the heart of almost all natural building techniques. Most of them will incorporate clay or uh, use clay in some way. So 
the um, the best thing to be able to do is find clay on your property or on a neighboring property where they're willing to give you some. Um, that is the absolute best case scenario. And to be able to find and identify and then use clay is quite, an, it's quite a simple but um, quite an involved process that takes a bit of an eye and I'd love to do a video on that later but uh, we just can't go into the scope of that yet. But ultimately, it's very simple to identify clay. You then get that clay, put it in water, which is hydrating it, it then accepts the water, holds the water, and turns into a slurry. And that slurry is what's used uh, in natural renders, cob, mud bricks, um, light earth, a whole bunch of them, which I'll go into when I'm explaining them.